as the eye wall began to hit us, the winds went from scary to terrifying. It crossed my mind that we had made a bad decision. Oh, they got a whole family out there in the water. I never in a million years imagined that I was going to lose everything again. Sandy is definitely coming into New York City. I did not see a living thing. It was apocalyptic. We've always had extreme weather. But over the last 20 years, as climate change has accelerated, it has mutated and become more dangerous and unpredictable. From dry lightning to the polar vortex, to bomb cyclones and the fire nado. Welcome to the new reality. Welcome to mutant weather. As the climate changes heating up the earth, mega storms are striking coastal cities around the world with greater frequency and intensity. If temperatures are warmer across the globe, both on land and in the ocean, we could see more moisture-laden storms. They could be more devastating. Fundamentally, what people have to realize is that the weather of the past in a particular location is not a good predictor of the weather of the future. Since 1950, as the population and industry have grown, more greenhouse gases are being produced, which in turn are trapping heat and causing the Earth's temperature to rise. Warmer oceans and moisture-laden air are creating the conditions for mutant megastorms. From Nova Scotia to New York, East Africa to South China, nowhere is safe. We've materially changed the dynamics of the climate. By burning fossil fuels, we've actually changed the chemistry of the atmosphere, and it's being realized in the form of the manifestation of extreme weather events. It's the extremes that we have to keep an eye on because those are what impact society. August 2017. In Houston, Texas, a typical late summer storm is brewing, fueled by distant Hurricane Harvey. Friday night, it started raining a little bit. It was off and on here and there. Mother of three, Aisha Nelson, follows along on Twitter as her mayor tells Houston to stay calm and stay put. I went to the grocery store because the mayor said we didn't have to leave, just buy stuff and keep it in the house in case we have to be stuck inside for a couple of days. We're going to expect a little flooding. I told my boys, I said, if it's storm and we get in here and the lights will go out, we're going to barbecue everything in the deep freezer. So they was like laughing and thinking it was crazy. For Aisha, Harvey is nothing she can't handle. I'm used to the flooding because we always have a little flood in the apartments I live in. What was really interesting about Harvey is that it happened in a place, Houston, Texas, and surrounding areas where they get a lot of rainfall and flooding. They experience flooding all of the time. And so people were like, eh, we, we, we're used to flooding. This is not going to be a big deal. 12 hours after making landfall, Harvey is downgraded to a tropical storm. It appears the worst is over. It was clear, no rain, water, everything was dry. So that evening, we all were gonna go by my sister's house so about 9 o'clock, I'm on my way to my sister's house. It started raining really, really hard. I could barely see. It was flooding in areas and everything. Veteran hurricane researcher Hal Needham is tracking Harvey's path. His reaction is very different from Aisha's. The night before Hurricane Harvey hit, I was in town. I was looking at the forecast, and my heart was just pounding. It was after midnight and I could not sleep. And what concerned me was all the ingredients were there that it was becoming more likely something catastrophic could happen. I felt like it was going to blindside a lot of people. There were no mass evacuations. A lot of people let their guard down. And so my concern was a lot of people are gonna flood that have never flooded before. October, 2018. High on the Florida panhandle sits a sleepy town called Mexico Beach. While hurricanes come close, residents have managed to miss the devastation. My family moved here in 1953. We've been in business here since that day. Hey, Al. Hey, come where have you been? 66 years, I have dealt with coastal living, coastal weather patterns, hurricanes, been part of many of them. 
Mayor Al Cathy is on a first name basis with nasty weather. Hurricane Opal, Kate, Irma. We have years of looking and watching and paying attention to hurricanes. Everything always went somewhere else. Recent hurricane history seems to back up the mayor. The west coast of Florida is somewhat sheltered. Typically in that stretch of the country, especially getting farther east in the panhandle, we haven't seen anything that strong ever. And this time again, it looks like the pattern is holding and hurricane season is nearly over. In the northwestern Pacific, megastorms are called typhoons. In the Indian Ocean, cyclones. And in the Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico, hurricanes. What they all have in common is they feast on waters heated by the warming planet. The Atlantic hurricane season, which often affects us here in the United States, typically starts in June, but it peaks in September. And that's because although the air temperatures are warm in June, the ocean temperatures take a bit longer. 600 miles south of Mexico Beach, Tropical Storm Michael is creeping across the Gulf. Hurricanes require very warm ocean temperatures to form. The Gulf of Mexico was perfect. It was like a bath in terms of the water temperatures. Hurricanes really start by having a cluster of thunderstorms over warm water. And as the cluster grows, air gets sucked into the middle and we get this low pressure. And because the Earth's surface is curved, it starts spinning. Michael had the environment that just produced these towering thunderstorms that just developed and developed. Later that day, Florida's governor declares a state of emergency. Right now, Tropical Storm Michael has 50 mile an hour winds and is forecast to move slower and grow stronger, making landfall as a category two storm. There's a classification system called the Saffir Simpson Hurricane Wind Scale that's really based upon damage and impacts of those winds. So those categories are one through five. The higher the number, the more catastrophic. Category two storms are serious, gusting between 96 and 110 miles per hour. Right now, about 100 miles out of the eyes, there's strong winds at the surface. On Monday, it was category two floundering around somewhere in the Gulf. In the back of our mind, it'll do like all the other storms. It'll go west, it'll go east, it'll die down. What the mayor doesn't realize is that unusually warm waters and favorable winds are creating perfect conditions ripe to turn Tropical Storm Michael into a monster. In Houston, Texas, Aisha Nelson is on her way to her sister's apartment complex, seeking refuge from Hurricane Harvey's relentless rains. As we got to my sister's house, we went inside. I was soaking wet, but the news said it wasn't going to be that bad. So I went to bed, went to sleep, thinking it was going to be fine. Harvey was just about to unleash all of its fury on Houston, and that was in the form of rainfall. Harvey was very different. It made landfall as a Category 4 hurricane, meaning the, the winds were really intense. But for days, it just stalled along the Texas coast. Hurricanes move by winds caused by high and low pressure systems. Sometimes these winds slow down or push against each other, causing hurricanes to get stuck or stall until the winds change and push the storm forward again. With these stalling hurricanes, it'll park down the coast from you. And for days, you'll get these bands of tremendous rainfall that come in. But there might be 12 or 15 hours between bands. So all of a sudden, the sun is out, everything looks OK, and then another band of rain comes in. So it's really hard to communicate to people that you're really in for a multi-day flood event where you could get 30, 40, 50 inches of rain. We've been seeing a lot of these in recent years. In Hurricane Harvey, it was these constant trains of moisture, these training thunderstorms that just kept dropping more and more rainfall. This is one of the calling cards of climate change because we know that when the atmosphere is warmer, there's more water vapor available, and that really is the fuel supply for these storms. At her sister's apartment complex, Aisha Nelson awakes to find herself trapped. More than a foot of rain has fallen overnight. Sunday morning, we get up to try to go see if the water went down. The water started coming in in her apartments, and I was telling them, I'm like, look, it looked like it's going to be bad. 
In the Gulf of Mexico, Hurricane Michael is gaining strength and heading straight for the Florida Panhandle. Michael is a dangerous major hurricane that is currently about 200 miles south-southwest of Apalachicola, Florida. And it's moving in a northerly direction about 12 miles per hour. It had the right look. It had the right ocean temperatures. There wasn't any wind that it was battling. It was the perfect scenario or the worst scenario. Maximum sustained winds have increased to about 125 miles per hour. Additional strengthening is possible. Mexico Beach has dodged the full force of mutant megastorms in the past, but they're not prepared for Hurricane Michael. Hurricane Michael is going to be a devastating storm to a part of Florida that's not seen a storm of this magnitude in quite some time. The time to evacuate and heed the local warnings is now. What made Hurricane Michael unique is that this did not start as an Atlantic long track hurricane. This started right close to home. It was born in the Gulf of Mexico. It took no time for it to intensify very quickly, which really made for difficult evacuation plans because it, it ramped up very quickly. On Tuesday afternoon, there was about 225 names on the list that people who had stayed. Mayor Al Cathy has to make a choice. Stay and hope Hurricane Michael misses or evacuate. We decided to go to bed, get up Wednesday morning, and make a decision. About 2 o'clock that morning, the storm took a, a more direct eye and upgrade to a 4. And by the time Wednesday morning came, it was too late to leave. Scientists have a name for this sudden escalation of a hurricane's force. One of the things that worries me as a scientist about hurricanes is that we're seeing more rapid intensification. If you look at Hurricane Michael from 2018, a rapidly intensifying storm just before landfall. Rapid intensification is when a storm increases its maximum sustained winds by at least 35 miles per hour in a day. All of a sudden, you're jumping several categories of intensity in that last 24 hours before landfall. Since 1950, if we take a list of the seven hurricanes that intensified most rapidly before landfall, four of those seven happened since 2005. We're starting to see a lot more of these. Rapidly intensifying megastorms are leveling coastal cities and killing multiple people across the globe. including in March 2019, when Cyclone Ide devastates the coast of East Africa, leaving more than 1,300 dead, making it one of the most deadly tropical cyclones to hit the area. Two months later, Cyclone Fanny strikes, killing 89 in eastern India and Bangladesh and causing $8.1 billion in damage. And in August of 2019, Typhoon Lakima kills dozens in China and brings severe flooding, forcing over one million people to evacuate. Something that's particularly concerning about climate change and extreme weather, as people with the least amount of carbon footprint or emission profile are most vulnerable. We know uh, that these storms in general are projected to become stronger as climate warms. When people talk about, oh, we still have 10 years to avert the catastrophe, this is nonsense. And I think we're at a point where <clears throat> we all need to behave as adults and look at it clearly and honestly. We're morally obliged to do everything we can to try to do the right thing. Disadvantaged populations are going to continue to bear the brunt of floods, heat waves, and hurricanes. In Mexico Beach, Florida, Feeding off the Gulf's warm waters, Hurricane Michael is mutating into a Category 5 megastorm. I was actually in Mexico Beach the night before Michael hit. At the time, it was a Category 2, expecting maybe it could be a Cat 3 or Cat 4. Really, the idea of it being a Cat 5 was really an outlier. We didn't really expect that to happen. Category 5 hurricanes start at 157 miles an hour, and you know generally they're getting up into the 160s, 170s, and those are maximum sustained winds. Those aren't gusts. It's just catastrophic. It can take a, a piece of straw and drive it through a telephone pole. Mayor Al Cathy is regretting his decision not to evacuate. We huddled up there and said, look, you know, 
Let's just prepare, get us some water, get some things. It crossed my mind that we had made a bad decision. October 2012, 1,200 miles away from Mexico Beach and its population of just over 1,000, Hurricane Sandy is churning northwards, heading straight for New York City, population 8 million. Possibly some thunderstorms near the center, which may make it a little dicey. And they're also reporting some turbulence in this quadrant. This is where the strongest winds were found. Is there any fool in New York flying right now? Besides us. Sandy was an unusual storm. Most hurricanes, when they are at that latitude, are moving northeast at a very, very rapid rate. Out to sea, gone, they might affect Nova Scotia. Sandy made a left-hand turn just as it reached New York City. Hurricanes don't do that. Just a little past five o'clock here in New York City, and it's already starting to drizzle a little bit. Storm chaser Mark Robinson rushes to New York to observe this historic event. Usually when I get to a, an area where a hurricane is about to strike, everybody's been evacuated, there's hardly anybody on the streets, and it's kind of eerie. And yet here in New York, only a few of them had cleared out. So it was like business as usual in New York City, even though this was going to be an extremely damaging hurricane. We're already seeing significant impacts from the storm, and the worst of it is about to hit. This is dangerous. If you don't need to be outside, don't take the risk. It's all about where the storm hits, not so much about how strong it actually is. There's just no other part of the United States other than, say, Los Angeles that has that many people and that much potential for infrastructure to get damaged. In Houston, Aisha Nelson and her children have been stranded in an apartment complex for 24 hours. The rain keeps coming and floodwaters are over two feet deep. The water started reaching up to like the third step in the apartment. My friend daughter said the water is coming in through the back and it looked like her walls are starting to cave. I told her, I said, um, start unplugging everything in the house at the bottom so it won't catch on fire. And so I told him to fill the tub up with water so in case somebody has to use the bathroom, we can still flush the toilets and stuff. I told everybody that we need to go upstairs. Facing an unprecedented flooding disaster for Houston, everyone in the apartment turns to Aisha. I have three boys, but I also have their friends with me too. I was responsible for other people's kids. So it was like seven kids I was responsible for. Not only did we have the Hispanic neighbors came from the other side, then we had another set of family coming where we were at. So and now it's like 30 of us. We all just sitting in the room. I had to go in survival mode to where I had 30 plus people looking at me. 12 years earlier, Aisha lost everything but her life in the deadliest natural disaster to hit the United States in almost a century. Because I went through Hurricane Katrina, everybody just instantly thought that I just knew what to do. Hurricane Katrina is now designated a Category 5 hurricane. We cannot stress enough the danger of this hurricane poses to Gulf Coast communities. Katrina caused more than $100 billion in damage and over 1,800 deaths. My house was maybe 10 minutes away from the 17th Street Canal. That's the main levee canal that controls all the other levees. So once that levee broke, my house was underwater. The water had got as high as up to the roof. This is a family of what looks to be five people completely stranded. The family make it out OK? I don't know. I, I still haven't found my mommy and my two children. With Katrina, I cried for a couple of weeks because I was like, I don't have nothing. I lost everything. I have no baby pictures of my sons. I have none of that, no memories or nothing. Everything is gone. I never in a million years imagined that I was going to lose everything again. On the Florida Panhandle, Mutant Megastorm Michael slams into the coast as a Category 5 hurricane with winds roaring at 161 miles per hour. The storm started around 11 o'clock. I 
I knew within 30 minutes that it was a different storm than, than Mexico Beach had ever experienced. By 12 o'clock, you could not see the shrubbery right outside our window. We could hear, of course, things hitting the house. But we couldn't see nothing. And uh, it was eerie to not know what was going on outside other than by sound. We huddled up and prayed and hugged everybody. Al Cathy is blindsided by a mutant megastorm phenomenon called a whiteout. Sometimes when you're talking about a winter storm, we talk about whiteouts. It can happen in a hurricane too, where the water droplets uh, and the rain are moving so fast that you literally can't see five to 10 feet in front of you. And it's just a wall of water. The entire world turns into white fog. Storm chaser Mark Robinson is on the ground as Michael makes landfall. The thing that I remember most about Hurricane Michael was the roar. It's the kind of thing that you don't hear as much as you feel it. As the winds began to really ramp up, we knew that the eye wall was approaching, strongest part of the hurricane. And as the eye wall began to hit us, the winds went from scary to terrifying. We have big glass windows and doors, and you could see them flexing from the pressure. It was like an airplane. You, your ears, you could feel it in the house. I said, if that window breaks, it's going to suck everything out of this house. In Houston, residents are desperate. Floodwaters are over three feet deep, and there are reports of multiple drownings. We just got rescued out, so this is the first time we've even seen how much, how much water it has been, so it's crazy. I have never experienced anything like this. I didn't even imagine that it was going to be this catastrophic. Aisha Nelson, her family, and neighbors are trapped in a tiny apartment watching the floodwaters rise higher. That day, the rain was coming down so hard. When you step down into the water, it would have been up over your head almost. And I can't swim, so I was so terrified. People is drowning. The people underneath the bush over there, and they holding on, they got people on the roof over there too. <laughs> oh my God. By Tuesday night, Harvey has dropped more than 50 inches of water and there's no end in sight. We don't have no food. I haven't ate in two days. No water. My baby is dehydrated. All my baby doing is sleeping. All we kept hearing is alarms and the sirens going off of the emergency system. And it was just like, that was just another thing that was just terrifying. I'm praying that they get us, because if they don't get us soon, they're not going to get us at all. 4148, no, it's taller than because Harvey stalled, it brought in several days of several thunderstorms. And in each thunderstorm, they were filled with tropical moisture. These are moisture-laden thunderstorms. So just tons of rainfall out of each one of these. And you start training thunderstorms over the same city for two days that's already prone to flooding, you've got a big problem. Houston sits on top of wetlands and has poor natural drainage. After three days of Hurricane Harvey, the ground is utterly saturated. The forest, the fields, the wetlands that were originally here, they're now gone. They're paved over. And when the water comes down, it hits these areas. It doesn't absorb. At the apartment, Aisha decides to move her family to higher ground. I decided to get on the roof because when I looked out the window across the street, the buildings were starting to come apart from the water. So I was getting afraid, and I was like, what we, the next step, the highest place we can go is the roof. I just wanted to make sure we had a, at least a way out. But there's a problem. 
This window pane right up here was about the size of the window. The window was so small, I could barely fit through the window. And my son, friend, is a heavy set guy. He's like, he might be about 300 pounds. And I was worried about him. So if we had to get on the roof, I didn't want to leave this little boy behind. With 30 people relying on her and with no tools, Aisha must improvise quickly. I took a 20 pound dumbbell and broke the window. And once I got the frame out, I took two pillows and put it inside the um, windowsill so they won't cut themselves. I was not going to leave that apartment without those kids. I don't think I would be able to live with myself. On the Florida Panhandle, mutant megastorm Michael is unleashing absolute destruction. Right now, you can barely see beyond a football field ahead of you. The trees are blowing sideways. Where I'm looking at from the, the foyer of this hotel, the wind just blew open the exterior doors. Yeah, it's bad. It was full bore. We're in the middle of an eye of the storm. We have sustained winds of over 150 miles an hour. The house hit my house, by the grace of God, held together. I have never seen the likes of anything like this, never. Michael was a scary storm. When you're talking winds over 250 kilometers an hour, that takes apart buildings. That means debris is flying through the air. If you're in a car and you get struck by a steel pole, that's going through the car. It's not even going to slow down when it enters your body. Michael is the first Category 5 hurricane to make landfall in the United States in more than 25 years. Category 5? Those winds matter. When you're talking about winds over 250 kilometers an hour and above, sustained, that will wipe everything out in its path. As destructive as hurricane winds can be, they are not the deadliest part of these megastorms. We often think about the hurricane wind because that's what the category number is based on, but really what kills most people is the flooding. So about 50% of people die from saltwater storm surge. Storm surge is where you have the momentum of the hurricane for days piling up the water on the one side of the storm. And it literally grows and grows and grows. And you can see the surge coming in. And that gets pushed on shore. You know, a lot of people lose their cars, lose their homes. Hurricane Michael pushed this 15 to 16 foot wall of water across Mexico Beach and areas just east of Panama City. I interviewed these two guys. They're talking on the phone and saying, where's the neighbor's house? Gone. They're just trying to survive the storm. The water's up to their neck, and they're just being tossed in and out of rooms and, and being sucked in and out of rooms in their homes. Crazy, I mean, crazy, crazy story. One of the biggest threats of climate change is sea level rise as we see glacier melt, as we see the ice sheets melting, that adds fresh water to the oceans and elevates the sea level. That's really water added on top of the storm surge levels. It's becoming more likely that something catastrophic is going to happen, it's becoming more likely that people are going to flood that never flooded before. On America's eastern seaboard, Hurricane Sandy is mere miles from making landfall in New York City. Mark Robinson tracks the incoming megastorm from Rockaway Beach. Even though Sandy was still offshore, I remember kneeling down on the boardwalk as this storm began to come in, and you could feel the whole boardwalk lifting up with every single wave. Mark knows New York is in trouble. Sandy is really beginning to make itself felt here north shore of Long Island. You can see the flooding behind me. In fact, I'm up to my knees in this water right now. Sandy is definitely coming into New York City and making a huge mess. The biggest culprit in Sandy was storm surge. The surge was going to be at its highest at the exact moment the tide was going to be at its highest, not only for the day, but for the month. And that meant that New York City was going to be dealing with surge 
like they'd never seen before. I remember walking down a street and looking at a sewer grate, like a manhole cover, and there was water shooting out of that. And I thought, that that's not right. The water's supposed to go the other way. That definitely makes me nervous. That is water coming out of the sewer. The New York City subway, which is extensive, it goes everywhere in New York, that stood a real potential of getting completely flooded. And that's exactly what happened. A hurricane really produces a storm surge that has several destructive elements. The initial storm surge pushes in very rapidly, can cause a loss of life. It can cause, you know, a lot of damage to buildings, but then the salt water stays around for a while and it can soak into the ground. Buildings can start to corrode and fall apart. You know, a year or two after that storm, all of a sudden you're seeing construction fall apart. Why? Because it was inundated by salt water. This is Bond and Carroll Street in Atlanta, and it's winding. When you put salt water into electrical <laughs> anything, uh, you're asking for serious problems. In Houston, with floodwaters cresting at 60 inches, Aisha Nelson has run out of places to seek refuge from Hurricane Harvey. We're on the roof now. We got on the roof about 4 in the morning. It's pouring down, raining. We have blankets on top of us. We all huddled up. It's like 30 of us getting soaking wet. We'll go in and out of the uh, window to try to stay a little dry so we won't be sick. And then the sun is starting to come up, but it's still raining hard. And it's like the rain don't want to stop. As the sun rises, Aisha sees Harvey swallowing up her adopted city. There was these three girls holding on to a tree. And they were trying to hold one of the girls up, but the current was so strong, it ripped the clothes off of the girl. And they couldn't hold her no more. Once they let her go, her body was hooked on a fence. I found out that girl was actually a girl that I knew. I offered her to come over with us to the house, and she told us she was going to go by a friend house. That really kind of messed me up because I had just talked to her. Aisha is running out of time and hope. Me, my niece, my sister, we all were calling different places, trying to get us some help. Things was getting intense for me and my family and everybody around me. I see three dead bodies. Now please help us. <laughs> I just knew that we needed help. And Facebook was my only platform that I had at the time. I was just really trying to get out of home's way. It was terrifying that it was so much water and it was too much water to drink, so I was afraid. It's just unbelievable. We never experienced anything like this. Aisha's desperate pleas for help go viral. Rescuers are dispatched. But Aisha, her family, and 25 others have to brave Harvey's treacherous floodwaters to reach them. Once we came down off the roof, we had to go outside. The water was over the cars, but we had to walk through that water to get to the boat. I let my oldest son take my baby with him because I didn't know if I was gonna see my kids again. I wanted all the kids to go and be safe because, you know, they, they're young and they had a life to live. I, I lived. If, if it was my time to go, I would have went. All outside. A day after Hurricane Sandy makes landfall, New Yorkers are sifting through the wreckage looking for survivors. I'm right by the boardwalk. People are walking around. It's about 10 a.m. And someone's apartment is full of sand. Sandy hit us very hard. It was a storm of historic intensity. Unfortunately, so far, we've had 18 uh, fatalities citywide as a result of the storm. The most unique part of Hurricane Sandy was the number of people 
that it affected. If it had gone a little further north with the same amount of wind and surge, it wouldn't have hit the most populated part of the United States. I remember standing in a park just underneath one of the major bridges that lead from Queens into Manhattan. And I'm staring at a city that is normally lit up with, there's activity, it doesn't matter what time of day, New York is always going. And this storm, Hurricane Sandy, had managed to silence it. Hurricane Sandy kills 147 people, including 48 in New York. It's the fourth costliest storm in U.S. history, causing an estimated $70 billion in damage. We are starting to see more and more billion dollar weather events. And I think many of the corporate entities in the United States are starting to recognize that. On the Florida Panhandle, residents awaken to the ruins left by Hurricane Michael's winds and storm surge. We are in Mexico Beach. This is a total mess. This morning, Florida's Gulf Coast, Panhandle, and Big Bend are waking up to unimaginable destruction. This hurricane was an absolute monster. So many families have lost everything. So many lives have been changed forever. Thursday morning, walking on Highway 98, the devastation was everywhere. There were just piles of debris. There were people going through those piles trying to find a picture or a shoe or, you know, some personal belonging. It destroyed our water tank. It destroyed our civic center. It took our fire department away. It took our police department buildings away. It took our meeting house. Mexico Beach, uh, just after Just the mayor, I went from being someone that, hey, my water bill's not right, or my garbage didn't get picked up, to how do we put our lives back together? We haven't had no way to connect with people other than walking around trying to find people, but this is, uh, this is unbelievable. This storm was, I mean, Catastrophic's not even the word for it. I've watched TV for years and seen people crying in the street and their houses are destroyed. And I've always thought, what a terrible loss. But until you live it, you can't, the feelings are different. And I can speak firsthand. I mean, that just took me to my knees. 80% of our city was destroyed during Hurricane Mike. How can Mother Nature in three hours do that? Crazy. I ended up hiking through a swamp for two hours. I had to traverse over new ravines that were cut from water. I did not see a living thing. I didn't see any flies, any mosquitoes, no birds, no fish, no snakes or frogs or reptiles, nothing. It was like the whole world was dead. And I think what happened is it pushed in such a violent storm surge. I didn't see the carcasses of any animals. I think it just sucked them all out to sea. We had four fatalities. But considering the level of devastation, I mean, to me, that's a miracle. I hate that we had any fatalities, but to see what our town looked like, uh, I think that's a miraculous number. It's the third largest recorded storm in the history of the United States that's ever hit a populated coastal area. Can you imagine what Mike would have done to a, a more densely populated area? In Houston, Aisha and her family are finally safe and finding refuge in the city's convention center. I cried like a baby because I was just so happy it was safe. Although dry and on solid ground, the trauma of Hurricane Harvey remains with Aisha and her family. They got to see everything and they, they, I know they remember some stuff. And like with my oldest son, I feel like he deal with anger issues now. My middle son, he don't really say too much. He's really quiet. He keep a lot of stuff bottled inside. 
my baby, if he see rain and thunder, he's running and getting under the cover, or he's telling me, we got to move. A storm is coming. You know, he's terrified. When I sleep, all those pictures kept popping back up in my head about those people that drowned. <laughs> and I really think I have, like, depression a little oh bit, because with the last storm that was coming, I got into a panic. I'm starting to live life to the fullest and trying to do things that I've never done before because I know that life is not promised and things happen within the blinking of an eye. All evidence points to a reckoning with mutant weather. We know the climate is changing, it's warming. Sea surface temperatures are warming. We're seeing storms intensify more rapidly. We're seeing other storms stall out and dump tremendous rainfall. I don't know how well you can hear me because of the wind, but uh, it is about 6.30 in the morning on Man of War Key. In September 2019, a new mutant megastorm rapidly intensifies before making landfall. Category 5 Hurricane Dorian stalls over the northern Bahamas. With 185 mile per hour winds, it obliterates everything in its path. Rising sea levels contribute to a massive 23 foot storm surge. To the world, Dorian is a harbinger of future deadly mutant weather. With all the studies that we've had and all of the worst case projections, we are in the crisis deep enough right now. It's not future tense. We probably will be looking at a, possibly a category six uh, uh, category now for hurricanes. Coastal cities could soon face a new type of megastorm, category six hurricanes with sustained wind of over 200 miles per hour and potential storm surges of 17 feet or higher. We've always had these vicious storms, and climate science suggests that these storms are having higher impact now. We're really loading the atmosphere with carbon dioxide, heat trapping gases, and we're seeing you know, higher CO2 levels than we've ever seen before. We're trapping heat, we're seeing warmer climate, warmer oceans, and we're seeing a lot of ice sheets starting to melt. You add a hurricane on top of that, you're in a lot of trouble. A third of the world's population lives within striking distance of a catastrophic coastal megastorm. And with each hurricane season, more and more lives are impacted by living on the front lines of mutant weather. Here we are nine months after the storm and you still see this. <laughs> There's just a great indication of how ferocious this thing was. You can't overcome 17 and a half feet of storm surge and 150 mile an hour sustained winds. We, we can't do it. After going through Katrina and then Harvey, if another storm comes and it says it's coming towards Texas of any sorts, I'm gonna take my family and we're gonna just leave because I can't take the chances of going through a third storm. I can't go through another one. If rapidly intensifying megastorms and stalling hurricanes are the new normal, can humankind survive the coming mutant weather? There's more Katrina's, more Hurricane Sandy's coming, and they're going to be of greater magnitude and intensity than the past. We know that the warmer the ocean water, the easier it is to sustain a hurricane and to develop a tropical system. So if we think of global ocean temperatures being warmer, that could mean that we see more of a favorable environment for hurricanes to develop. We can no longer get too anchored on the wind speed or the category of the storm. We have to look at the rain potential of the storm, how fast the storm is moving, or is it going to stall out? We cannot cheat the system when it comes to climate change. If we try to cheat the system, we're gonna lose, and increasingly so, we're losing around the world. People ask me often, do you have hope? And the hope I would have is that we will treat each other decent and we will start to behave in a better relation with the earth now while we still can. Because the crisis is upon us and today is better than tomorrow. They come out of nowhere, boom, zero visibility. And that's terrifying. Weather systems have a huge impact on air pollution. 
you see these big clouds of pollen over top of the cities, it looks gruesome. Air pollution is invisible most of the time. What's out of sight is out of mind. I want to make sure my daughters don't have to deal with this invisible killer. We've always had extreme weather. But over the last 20 years, as climate change has accelerated, it has mutated and become more dangerous and unpredictable. From dry lightning, to the polar vortex, to bomb cyclones, and the fire nado. Welcome to the new reality. Welcome to mutant weather. Humankind is watching our planet warm at accelerating, alarming rates. A hotter Earth and shifting weather patterns are worsening air quality, fueling dust storms, and suffocating our major cities. Climate change is all about change in the atmosphere. It's weather systems shifting from one place to another, whether it's wetter or drier, hotter or cooler, that's gonna affect the level of air pollution in the air. Climate change will have potentially dramatic effects on different parts of the world for air quality. From the southwestern United States to India and China, the world could soon be facing an air apocalypse. When people think about climate change, they primarily think about change in temperature and warming. But the other thing that we tend not to think about so much, which is also extremely important, are the changes in air quality that we have produced over the last few decades. For over a century, our industrialized economies have been burning fossil fuels and belching pollution from smokestacks and tailpipes. This includes greenhouse gases that trap heat, warming global temperatures. It's been increasing a lot faster in the last few decades because we use a lot more fossil fuels than we used to. And those gases, of course, are retaining energy and allowing the, uh, the world to slowly but surely warm. As warming increases, so too does air pollution. Air pollution is too much the wrong stuff in the air at the wrong place in the wrong time. We have, along with the emission of carbon dioxide and the emissions of methane, introduced into the atmosphere uh, unprecedented uh, levels of lead, sulfur, cadmium, small particulates in the atmosphere, on and on and on. A lot of nasty things that dramatically impact our health. Close to 10 million people a year die from bad air quality. We have huge numbers of premature deaths coming from areas that are affected by severe air pollution. We're in the age of mutant air with deadly smog, suffocating pollution, and epic dust storms threatening our lives. July 9th, 2018. It's a dry and dusty summer in Mike Olbinski's hometown. Based out of Phoenix, Arizona, I chase storms for a living. Phoenix averages the second lowest amount of rain of any U.S. city, just eight inches per year, creating the right conditions for mutant storms called haboobs. The haboob is basically a dust storm, a wall of dust, um, and it has its origins from the Middle East. It's an Arabic word, much like the word monsoon, which we also use out here. In Arizona, some of North America's largest haboobs form usually during monsoon season between June and September, when the state gets up to half its annual precipitation from frequent thunderstorms. And this July, monsoon season is expected to be true to form. July 9th, 2018 was one of my favorite haboob chases of all time. The elements are aligning for a mega haboob, potentially one of historic scale. To form a haboob in Arizona, we look for conditions where it's very hot, but it's also very dry. Now it has to be unstable enough to form a thunderstorm because it's that thunderstorm that creates the winds that picks up all that dust off the desert floor. There's thunderstorms that you'll get hit by a blowing wind and you also you know, like, whoa, it got really cold and this gust of wind hit and the trees start blowing and then maybe a storm comes behind it. But there was no dust with it because you live in a place that's just got trees and grass and all that. So out here, these dust storms form from thunderstorms, creating this big outflow boundary of wind that starts pushing up and it starts picking up dust. 
you start to see that more and more. And so really the dust is just getting picked up by this wall of, of fast moving wind. Haboobs really are the gusty edge of big thunderstorms. And so they're fed by the size of the thunderstorm itself. The biggest haboobs are associated with large thunderstorms. Sometimes we call them supercell thunderstorms because they're big complexes of storms that are the entire depth of the atmosphere. And those huge storms drive out very cold winds at the bottom of them. There are different types of thunderstorms, a single cell thunderstorm, a multi-cell thunderstorm, and then the big gun, the supercellular thunderstorm, which is a whole other ball of wax. So that's where we're talking about something really different, and that's rotation in a thunderstorm. A supercell is one that actually starts to rotate, and that has to happen uh, due to wind shear. So when we have winds coming from different directions with height, we can get the entire thunderstorm to start to spin. And when a thunderstorm starts to spin, it can sustain itself for hours and produce a powerful downdraft that creates a haboob. When the rain-cooled air falls from a thunderstorm, it increases its speed. And like pouring a glass of water on a table, it spreads out in all different directions, picks everything up that's on that table. So that downburst is doing the same thing with the desert. It's rushing to the hit, hit the desert floor, and then it picks up all that dust, and it spreads it out in all different directions. A downburst is when you've got such cold air coming in from the upper levels of the atmosphere to the surface. And when that happens, we can get this cold pool sort of out ahead of the thunderstorm, and it often will form a shelf cloud, which are really remarkable to see, and they look like these, almost looks like the end of the world or a big spaceship coming your way. But what that is, is the cold air is pooling out of the thunderstorm, and that can create very strong winds and these strong winds are coming directly out of the thunderstorm and it can accelerate as it gets to the surface. So if you can grow a big thunderstorm and it happens to pass over a very dusty surface, such as a dry riverbed or uh, abandoned farmland, then it will kick up a lot of dust and it can transport those over neighboring areas, whether that's another farm or whether that's a large city. Anticipating a monster of a storm, Mike checks its progress. Waking up on July 9th, looking at the models again, they held consistent for three days straight. A very strong line of storms moving off northeast of Phoenix, where these cliffs and storms love to form on there, and the models just had a big, heavy line moving right through town. And I knew if they move through Phoenix and keep going southwest, they're going to pick up dust, because that's where it happens. Not only are they going to be good, they're probably going to cause damage. So there was, like, in a little bit of you know, nervous excitement for that day. But this storm is unlike anything that Mike had chased before. Ottawa, Canada. Don Jurgens and Daniel Coates track airborne pollen, and they're seeing some surprising things. Pollen bursts or pollen storms, um, pollen vortex is also something I've heard. We see a much higher than normal pollen level in the air at certain times of the year. It's a large amount of pollen being released all at once. And you've seen things happen in, in Carolinas, in Australia, and in South Africa recently, where you see these big clouds of pollen over top of the, the skies or over top of the cities. And uh, it looks uh, gruesome. Doppler radar can even pick up these pollen grains as they're moving across the landscape. Changing weather can make pollen events much, much worse. If air masses aren't moving and you have the same air mass over you for day after day after day and the pollen season is underway, it can really produce heavy amounts of pollen. So we can start to see the pollen levels go from low to medium to high to very high. And that can really affect people that have allergy issues. Climate change is creating more days with stagnant air masses that keep pollen trapped at ground level. Pollen is a huge issue. It is something that affects millions of people worldwide. Pollen affects up to 25 to 30% of the population in any given country. And so it has a huge impact on both the economy and people's health. Here's what happens when pollen invades the human body. Pollen creates an overreaction in your immune system. 
your immune system sees something coming into it that's foreign, and that's why you see people who get sick. You might get watery eyes or a runny nose, coughing, even asthma can kick in. And folks who have asthma problems really have to be careful. It is a severe issue for human health and human quality of life. And the fact that we just accept it as an everyday issue baffles my mind because people suffer dramatically. Some of them, it's almost debilitating how much they suffer from seasonal allergies. Mutant weather is forcing us to invent new terms to describe alarming phenomena. Terms like dry lightning, the polar vortex, and the fire nado. But the first of these new terms, smog, was popularized some 70 years ago in London, England. It was brutal. The smog in London was nasty. It was a result of burning a lot of coal without a lot of restrictions on, uh, on, on the smokestacks. So it's just all that smoke was going into the lower lying air, which was combined with actual fog in the 1950s in London. And they had a lot of smoke and fog at the same time, and they contracted the two words together to say smog. The name smog sticks and quickly spreads around the world. Since then, though, we've really expanded it to consider modern smog, which, which would be photochemical smog, the kind of thing you get over a large city like Los Angeles, for example. Smog doesn't come in one shape or form. It comes in a variety of ways. That's what's so insidious about it. Low-level ozone, for instance, add into that particulate matter mix all that together, shine sunlight on it, and now you have this horrific mix of chemicals that sits at a low level, sits right on top of your city. These days, photochemical smog, or just smog, is really a product of car exhaust and vehicle exhaust, and sometimes some smokestack exhaust, and other nasty air pollutants reacting in sunlight. Together, this big soup they form is called smog. And there are alarming signs that global warming and changing weather are making modern smog much worse. Smog can be really adversely impacted by weather patterns. The more calm or still that the air is, the more stagnant it is, the more likely it is for any kind of emission, smoke, tailpipe, whatever it is, to stay right where it is and not be blown away. And the more it can build up in a confined space, the worse and worse it gets, the higher the concentrations will be. Under normal conditions, the sun heats the earth, warming the air closest to the ground. As you move higher in the atmosphere, the air is cooler. The warmer low-lying air rises, and as it rises, cools again, so the air continues to circulate. But sometimes, low-lying air will cool faster than the air above it, which traps it under a warm layer. Cool air below, warm air above, this is an inversion. And as industry puts pollution into the air, it remains trapped close to the ground with nowhere to go until strong enough atmospheric activity can shake things up and move the pollution away. There's an interesting relationship between smog and storms when you have an inversion. Smog gets trapped in that lower atmosphere, right over top of the city that you're living in. And storms tend to break that up. They tend to actually overturn the atmosphere and clear out the smog. So your best days in terms of air pollution are just after the storms or during them. Some scientists predict global warming will worsen existing air pollution in many places around the world. Heat waves and increasing periods of stagnant air will cause smog to linger in place, triggering asthma and other dangerous respiratory illnesses. Phoenix, Arizona. Storm chaser Mike Olbinski is watching as a monster haboob forms. But Mike's got a problem. He's not even in the same state. The morning of the storm, I was out in California. I knew the dust storm wasn't gonna happen until later in the afternoon. I had planned to drive all the way back to Phoenix, get home, 
grab food and the cooler and all the camera gear and then head south. And there's gonna be a big line of storms going through Phoenix and Casa Grande and they're gonna push west down Interstate 8 and then we'll just jump in front of them and we'll have a dust storm. I raced here and amazingly, we were just about 10 minutes behind our schedule. The haboob is not waiting for Mike to catch up. I saw some microbursts just kicking up dust. We're like, okay, here it goes. I got on the freeway trying to blast west and there's a wall of dust in front of us already. So we were on the wrong side of it. And so I knew we just had to get through of it. Incredible. I go from crazy pouring rain to driving through just zero visibility of dust. Uh, Mike is a veteran storm chaser, and he respects the power of this haboob. Haboobs, once they hit you or they come out of nowhere, boom, zero visibility. And that's where it's terrifying. That's where bad accidents happen. Um, right around, you know, this area where we are, there's been um, multiple, like, multi-car crashes, fatalities. Oh, boy. Dust storms in Arizona are particularly deadly on the interstates. There's a stretch of interstate between Phoenix and Tucson that's one of the most deadly in the state only because of dust storms. Your visibility can drop from unlimited to only a few meters in a very short time, and that creates huge problems for people driving down that road. But haboobs bring another danger. These towering clouds of dust carry serious health risks. Some people absolutely love them for the photographic nature of them. Other people take them a lot more seriously, knowing how dangerous they can be. We urge most people to go indoors because a haboob is actually in this part of the country a health hazard. It carries spores and fungus that if you inhale, potentially can make you very sick. Haboobs here in the Southwest contain a mixture of very coarse sand, uh, which makes them look spectacular, but they also have much finer particles in them or they can have other chemicals in them. For example, if that dust originates over old farm fields that has fertilizer, then those chemicals be carried in the dust as well. Dust pollution is quite literally air quality problems that come from too much dust. Dust exposure can affect our health, mostly through our lungs. When you breathe in dust into your lungs, the natural thing is for that dust to be trapped on the mucus inside your lungs and you might cough or expel it in some way, or your body itself has uh, cellular mechanisms that will help get rid of it through your body. But sometimes it can be overwhelmed or it might not be able to do that. A warming world will cause deserts to expand and create far more dry, dusty landscapes that can taint the air we rely on. When we inhale dust, the effects can be immediate. We can be caught in a dust storm, maybe coughing and hacking right away, or they might be far more subtle effects that take years or even decades before we notice the health effects. There's an analogy called the boiling frog. And what this is, is the idea that if you put a frog in a pot and slowly turn up the temperature, it won't notice that it's being boiled alive. Air pollution is just like that. If you live with it for years and years and years, you won't notice that your lungs are being eaten alive. The biggest challenges health-wise from particle pollution tend to be lung problems, of course, because you're breathing them in, but they can turn into other things, heart disease, uh, breathing problems, even cancer depending on who you are or how concentrated they are, can really be uh, pretty nasty. July 9th, 2018. Driving outside of Phoenix, Mike is white knuckling his way through the storm. After I punched that wall of dust, there's not very many stops on that interstate, um, but there's an overpass that I love and it's Beagle Valley Road. We're up about 30 feet, so you can see the mountains, you can see the desert floor. When I'm out chasing and I'm on something good, 
I literally cannot stop the car fast enough. I'm sometimes getting out of the car almost before I throw it in park, and I will throw my door open and race around to the back, and sometimes I have my cameras on the tripods already. Anything I can do to shorten the amount of time from stopping to setting up my camera, I do. And then I turn around and look at it. Oh my God. Oh. Yeah, you pull over. And it just basically came right at me. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Mike is now face to face with a colossal haboob as its surrounding storm generates 45,000 lightning flashes. In person, a haboob can be kind of terrifying. A mile tall, um, touching the base of the clouds with massive clouds building over them, 100 miles wide and um, dense and churning. And, and they can be freaky to kind of see coming at you, especially you know if you haven't experienced them before. The big wall of dust associated, you know, that haboob is really due to the thunderstorm winds collapsing and it pushes out across the entire desert floor, picks up all that dust, and it looks like a big wall of dust. It might be moving at you 20, 25 meters per second. And so it's, it might look like it's not coming at you, but it's really progressing. Monster epic haboob right here. This thing is unbelievable. It was started becoming spookier with big old thunderheads building over it. The wall of dust, sometimes they come and they're just a wall of dust with some clouds over it, but if you have a big towering thunderstorm above it, it's, they're just, they look so scary. Ottawa, Canada. Don Jurgens and Daniel Coates have been analyzing a vexing increase in pollen pollution. No easy thing to do given the nature of pollen. It's too small to be able to see with the naked eye, with the exception of um, the yellow ring that you get around puddles after it rains. It's not like air. You can see it, but pollen is pretty much invisible to the naked eye. So people inhale it and they have no idea they're actually inhaling the pollen. To track increases in pollen, Dawn and Daniel developed a way to make the invisible visible. The samplers themselves are located at usually five to six feet in height, and so it's representative of the air that we breathe. It rotates at 4,500 RPM, and it spins for one minute and it's off for nine, and it does this for 24 hours. Everything that's in the air slams basically right against the rods that is coated in a silicone grease, and that captures all the pollen, spores, and anything else that's in the air. And once those rods are removed and then shipped to our office, we have a beautiful um, depiction of what's in the air through the pollen analysis that our, our technicians do. Once we receive the samples here at the laboratory, stain is added and then it's viewed under the microscope. And then one of our technicians will, uh, will view the sample and do the analysis for both uh, pollen and mold spores that is in the, in the sample. After the analysis is done, we take the counts and we, we create forecasts for things like the weather network or apps. And people can see up to four days ahead what's gonna be happening in the air. And when they crunch the numbers, what do Dawn and Daniel find? We have over 25 years of data for most of the sites across Canada. And what we're seeing is a large increase in pollen year over year in some of the major metropolitan cities across Canada. See, allergy is just getting worse and worse every year. It's a trend that worries weather watchers outside of Canada as well. And if we continue to increase the pollen, we may start to see folks who haven't been allergic to pollens in the past now become allergic because there's just so much of it in the atmosphere. Phoenix, Arizona. It's 5 p.m. and time is running out for Mike Olbinski to chase his storm of a lifetime. Haboobs are powerful, but also short-lived. Early on in the day, it felt like it. The models were very consistent, and as we were out chasing, um, the storms exploded just like they were predicted. But once they hit the ground, giant dust storms are also unpredictable. The monsoon is pretty tough to forecast. There's different spots of the state where there's, it's just gonna be drier and there's less vegetation, and that dust is just gonna feed into it and make it even um, better looking. And if a wall of dust starts traveling over an area where there's more vegetation or a city, it starts losing its intensity. So for me, I'm always thinking, where is this thing about to get good? 
Haboob was kind of moving to the southwest. We're gonna go west, stop again, and then we'll see it. Got to Gila Bend, pulled over to a wide area that I know, and waited, and waited, and waited, and the dust never came over the mountains. I'm like, did this day just end? I was so excited about 20 minutes ago, and now I see nothing. And that dust storm had just careened off to our right to no man's land, and there was nothing else. And I thought the day was done for a second. And then I was looking at radar and noticed the storms coming through Phoenix were so strong and they were pushing down right towards us. That's gonna come through and create the dust storm that we've been waiting for. Radar is the biggest tool that we use when we're storm chasing in the field. Basically, radar is sending out a signal to the storm, bouncing back to the radar and collecting data. And we use that to see you know, how heavy the rain is, we can detect snow, we can detect uh, hail. So went west a little bit more, pulled off in front of a farm, and sure enough, start seeing dust in the distance start coming again. And I'm like, here we go, it's gonna, we may not be, it may not be great, but at least we're gonna get some dust. And it comes through this farm and picks up and it hits us, jump back in the car, go west again, probably like 10 miles, jump out and all of a sudden look back and all of a sudden this wall of dust has just changed into something even more incredible than the first stop. Dust is the food coloring of the air and you get to see the dust churning and swirling and what the wind is actually doing. And at one point I had you know a tight frame on it and I'm looking at it through my camera and it's just this wall just slowly marching across and there's mountains there and the mountains are just dwarfed by this massive wall and the clouds above it. It looked like it was just this ominous wall just slowly marching across the desert. When a muted taboob is on the move, most people cower and run for cover. But storm chasers like Mike see things differently. And then the chase is on again. And then jump in the car again right before it hit us, kept going again. We stop again and it's even better. It was so incredible. I just had to stop right there on the freeway and turn around because I did not want to miss what I was looking at. And I stop and I just look up and it's just a mile high and stretching across from me, you can see just the folds, the density of it. Some of them can look like, you know, an orange kind of like washed out wall of dust. This looked like a living organism and it's the density and the churning and stuff was was unbelievable and I'm running around just trying to take pictures of this and that and whatever I could to capture it. Climate change is influencing weather systems by triggering a chain of events that has surprising and dangerous consequences for air quality. Exactly how climate change is going to have an effect on air quality in the future is one of these questions that we're doing a tremendous amount of research on. I've talked to a lot of atmospheric scientists. One of the aspects that they've seen with their research is this clustering of events. Rather than having storm systems moving through, moving across the planet at a regular pace, at a regular uh, time, what we're seeing instead is these storm systems are stopping. This is new behavior for storm systems. What we're seeing is 30 storms a month, but rather than occurring one per day, they're occurring 10 in one day, and then nothing for a long period of time, and then 10 in another day. And you wouldn't think that that's associated with air pollution, and yet, when you only have these storm systems occurring in clusters, what you have is stagnant air masses sitting in one place for a long period of time. And that's a huge air pollution problem. Stagnant air masses just sit over an area, the air doesn't move, all that pollution that we're producing just doesn't get swept away, and we're breathing that stuff in and living in a soup of our own making. Think of it like a thousand cars all sitting there idling, dumping carbon dioxide, ozone, carbon monoxide, but it can't get swept away, it can't get cleared away. 
now you're wandering around breathing that junk in. So stagnant air masses are pollution's best friend, but humankind's worst enemy. It's nearly sunset, 200 miles southwest of Phoenix, Arizona. It's been a long day of storm chasing in 105 degree Fahrenheit heat for Mike Olbinski. We chased stop after stop all the way to Yuma until dark. The density and the structure of all of it, and it just kept going. And we got it at this place where it just lit up orange at sunset and it was just churning down the freeway. And I've never had a chase of a dust storm that was just so thrilling, so photogenic with the most perfect network of roads. A mutant haboob is thrilling to a storm chaser, but its surrounding storm snaps trees, drops hail, and creates life-threatening conditions across the Southwest. Flights are canceled and streets are flooded in Phoenix. This haboob must have traveled over 150 miles. There was just a lot of moisture, got the heat. We have something else, something juicier in the atmosphere to help enhance these storms, push this thing and make it better. Thunderstorms move as quick as the upper level winds want to push them. So they can go really slow. They can be moving at a snail's pace, like five miles per hour, 10 miles per hour. But then they could be racing across the central plains as much as, you know, 80 miles per hour, over 100 kilometers an hour. Upper level wind speeds and the storms they push across the globe are dictated by the rotation of the Earth and the differences in atmospheric pressure caused by the way heat is distributed across the planet. The largest haboobs that we see in Arizona, you can get the dust lifted up several kilometers off the ground, but then the winds at that level transport the dust horizontally, and you might go five or 600 kilometers downstream with that lofted dust. So dust that started in Phoenix may eventually end up in Las Vegas or Los Angeles. These storms were able to move along, hold together, and create this amazingly strong outflow with such intense wind, too. Mike is not going to let anything stop him from capturing stunning images of the storm's last minutes. When I stopped in Yuma to wait it out, it sandblasted my truck. The next day, I looked at my windshield, and I had tiny little, almost microscopic dings over the whole thing where basically it got sandblasted watching this just unfold and watching it happen exactly as you predicted and being in the right spot, having, you know, already predicted two days ago that I'd probably be here. These, you know, monumental days are the reason why I chase. Haboob's very awe-inspiring, very picturesque in some way, but then once you get in the actual blowing dust, it's not so spectacular anymore. Um, people will tell me later, like, I would have been running from that. That dust storm was coming to me, I would be, I would be hiding in my car, hiding in my house. Even if I didn't have a camera, I would stand there in awe and you know, let the dust storm hit me because um, I can't think of anything more exciting than watching these monstrous things of nature, you know, unfold before your eyes. Burning fossil fuels puts pollution in the air and heats up our atmosphere. That extra heat worsens pollution by shifting weather patterns which create the right conditions for poor air quality, choking citizens from Cameroon to India to China. Officials are closing down factories and schools, as well as restricting driving during periods of severe air pollution. Changing patterns of wind, air, and temperature are creating the conditions for a new type of mutant weather, the air apocalypse. The Chinese air apocalypse refers to the issue of significant air pollution. There's a couple of reasons that you're, you're dealing with such a, a horrific problem in, in China, and one is the manufacturing issue, but the other half of it is that they are dealing with dirty energy sources. They've got lots of coal. They're trying to catch up uh, to the Western nations, developed nations, by using whatever energy source they've got. And one of the easiest and cheapest ones is coal. At the same time, in their winter, with very calm, stable conditions, so that the pollution builds up near the ground in higher and higher concentrations to the point where you literally can't see between buildings anymore. 
all the things that we enjoy, like smartphones, cars, forks and knives, all that manufacturing is now done in China. So we've taken all that pollution that we used to produce and moved it from our neighborhood to somebody else's. The main difference between the London smogs of the 1950s were that those smogs were made of smoke and fog, whereas the airpocalypse smogs in China are made without fog generally. It's really just stagnant conditions in winter with lots of buildup and a lot of pollution from huge, fast-growing cities. Climate change has warmed the Arctic Ocean and Siberia, reducing the difference between the warmest areas of China and the coldest causing stagnant winter periods where air masses remain in place for days. In the Chinese example, uh, very similar, still a lot of coal burning and other fossil fuel burning. And uh, the sheer quantities there in the low-lying air in winter are making for really bad visibility as well as really bad uh, particulate matter concentrations. It's the concentrations of super fine particles that have researchers worried, especially what they call PM 2.5 particles. PM 2.5 particles uh, refer to particles in the atmosphere, really dust and very tiny uh, particles of soot that are uh, 2.5 microns or less, so very small, uh, almost invisible. They're microscopic, and they can lodge very deep inside your lungs uh, because they're so small. They get way down into the small alveoli. And if they stick there long enough and are not expelled by your body, then they can cause health problems. Tiny PM 2.5 particles contribute to an estimated 4.2 million premature deaths globally every year. In China, the situation looks especially dire when combined with the effects of climate change. Scientists are finding that more frequent periods of stagnant air caused by a warming atmosphere will worsen China's smog and associated health problems. Add to that more frequent and long-lasting heat waves, and China is facing increasingly terrible health outcomes. This in a country that already loses an estimated one million citizens to pollution-related deaths each year. Ottawa, Canada. Pollen experts are watching levels increase year by year. They also know that global warming is increasing and they wonder about the connection. There has been research fairly recently in the scientific community that has explored the idea that higher CO2 levels um, can produce um, more pollen in different plants looking at ragweed, they found that higher CO2 levels were causing a higher level of pollen being produced by single plants. CO2 is actually plant food. Plant food makes bigger plants. Bigger plants means more pollen. There's a lot of research out there that's actually showing the pollen levels are increasing over the past decade. That's increasing not only because of the CO2, but also because the growing season is longer. With climate change, what you generally see is uh, warmer weather. With warmer weather, you can see a lot longer growing season. This especially is true for the trees that we've seen over the last 25 years. So when you have the warmer weather, there's more ability to create more pollen in both the trees and the weeds and the grasses, and hence you have more pollen release in the air. An increase in pollen in the air could lead to an increase in pollen-related mutant weather events. As the pollen seasons get longer and there's more pollen in the air, you will see these pollen vortexes or pollen bursts happen on a more regular basis. You could see more and more of this happening in the future. Phoenix, Arizona. Mike Olbinski understands that the beauty of dust storms is deceptive. As climate change dries out Arizona and other parts of the world, these storms are at risk of becoming more frequent and more destructive. Climate change is changing things on a, on a global scale. The climate is warming, the glaciers are melting, and I kind of almost hope that a lot of the stuff we're scared about doesn't happen, but I feel like it's probably going to. And I do believe that because of climate change, maybe there's more drought out here in Arizona. And maybe 2018, the reason we had such an epic dust storm was because it was so dry that there was just dust everywhere. And then we had an insane storm pick it all up and it was the most historic haboob we've ever seen. The fact that we are getting less rain and, and more you know, drought and heat, maybe we get less haboobs, but maybe they're stronger. 
we do see changes in the number of haboobs or large dust storms with climate change. But it's not always as simple as it seems. For example, because the uh, amount of dust that a storm will blow will depend on the supply of dust on the surface. If you have more rainy days, then you won't have as much. If you have drier conditions, but enough rain to wash rivers down uh, that then subsequently dry out, then you might have more dust. So it's a complex combination of conditions. Uh, generally speaking, areas that weren't arid that become arid are going to have more dust storms. I'm an optimist about the future quality of the year because I think at some point in the next decades here, we're going to get to the point where there really is a shift away from fossil fuels to renewables. And that will really help not only climate change, but it'll also help air quality because it, the source for both of them is burning of fossil fuels. Global warming is here to stay for the foreseeable future. The last five years are the five hottest years ever recorded. Climate change is happening, it will happen. We will see dramatic changes in the next few decades. Global warming makes air quality worse in a couple of ways. It makes us produce more air pollution because we're trying to uh, either heat our homes more or cool them down more. And it also can make the air quality that we have worse by making weather conditions worse for the air quality, make them more stagnant in some places or hotter to produce more smog. So actually two ways we lose with air pollution under climate change. The real danger with air pollution is that it's a slow moving, invisible killer. And it doesn't get you right away. It takes a long time to accumulate that damage, but eventually it's going to rear its ugly head. I'm definitely concerned when it comes to air pollution for my family. And our problems with air are global. Emissions and smog and smoke can travel great distances uh, across oceans. It can sometimes take days or weeks for it to do that. But if, uh, in fact, we can measure on the west coast of the United States, we can measure the odd air mass arriving that has all the signatures of Asian air in it. And of course, there's air from North America that makes it over to Europe. When pollution is blown away, it just goes downstream which would be fine if Earth was an infinite plane, because <laughs> it would just keep moving. But Earth is a globe, so when you move that pollution downstream, all that you're doing is moving it to somebody else, or eventually back to yourself. Climate change will enlarge deserts in the southwestern US, northern Africa, the Middle East, and Australia, creating more places where haboobs could blast people with sand and dust. Asthma kills more than 350,000 people worldwide each year. A warmer world will create a longer growing season for pollen producing plants, risking thousands more deaths each year. And as we continue to burn fossil fuels, pumping more harmful pollutants into the air that sustains us, Climate change leads to more stagnant summer days. The more than 4 million premature deaths we currently see each year from air pollution could continue to rise. Eventually, we will all have to reckon with global warming and its effect on air pollution. When we talk about climate change and air quality and health, it's easy to notice things that are easy to put in TV news, like hurricanes or major dust storms and haboobs. But in fact, the more dangerous thing might be the invisible part, the air pollution. We should care about the quality of our air simply because we live in it. <laughs> we exist in an ocean of air. It's what we need to survive. The billions of tons of chemicals we add to the atmosphere each year have mutated the air we rely on for our survival.